Hello everyone, I hope this finds you in good health. Welcome to Amuna Until the Sunset. In these emails, I try to focus on ideas of Amuna and the Parshiot, the portions we read from the Torah. Amuna, generally translated as faith, can also be described as accustoming oneself to see all the phenomena of life as manifestations of God's presence. This week, we are in the last Parsha, two portions of the Book of Bamidbar of Numbers, Matot Masse. I cannot believe we are almost done with the fourth Savior, the fourth book of the Torah. Thank you all for joining me this far. I appreciate all nearly 100 of you so very much. This week, I'm going to share a bit of childhood slash parenting psychology that I find really fascinating. A disclaimer, I know nothing about the reality of parenting, but thank God I have two pretty stellar ones. Developmental psychologist Diana Baumrind is famous for her research on parenting styles. In her theory, there are four kinds of parents. Number one, authoritarian slash disciplinarian. They focus on discipline, but are cold and removed. Number two, authoritative. They also focus on discipline, but are warm, nurturing, and flexible. Uninvolved. They have no real style of parenting. They either choose to be hands-off, or they have no interest in being anything. Number four, permissive slash indulgent. They set no boundaries, have limited or no rules for their kids, but are warm and nurturing. To give you a better idea of these styles, picture this scenario. Tomorrow, a junior high school aged child has a large exam. Their friend across the street just got the newest video game console. The child asks their parents to go over to that friend's house for the day. How will the parents respond? An authoritarian slash disciplinarian parent might answer, No, you can't go to your friend's house. Why? Because I said so. An authoritative parent might answer, No, you can't go to your friend's house. Why? You have a really important exam tomorrow, remember? An uninvolved parent might say, well, they're not even there to ask. A permissive slash indulgent parent might say, yeah, totally go. Here are some snacks to take over. Try to come back in one hour. The parent knows the child needs to study, but doesn't want their child to be angry with them, so they allow it. Research shows that the most effective style of parenting is authoritative, as you may have gathered. In this style, children are praised when they act admirably and reasonably punished when they act badly. They learn to be self-motivated and set high standards for themselves because their parents set high but reasonable expectations for them too. From this, we also learn that when a child doesn't understand why they are being kept from an enjoyable experience, they gain little from this quote-unquote punishment. Why am I giving you this child psychology lesson? Because Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, makes a few authoritative parenting moves in this week's Parsha. The tribes of Ruvain, Reuben, and Gad had a lot of livestock. As they stood in the land to the east of the Jordan River, in the area of modern-day Jordan, they realized that this land, not actually in Israel, was really prime for their cattle and sheep. They proposed to Moshe an idea. Can we stay over here with our livestock? Actually, just, just let us stay here. Moshe replies something to the effect of, What, and let your brothers fight for the land of Israel while you sit here with your cattle? Why are you discouraging your fellows to cross? By you staying here, you're scaring the rest of B'nai Israel. They'll think you're too scared to fight the people for the land, and that's why you're staying here. Moshe then compares this to the Miraglim, the spies, that returned with a fearful report of the land back in Parshat Shalach. Remember the twelve spies, how ten of them brought back the giant fruit to show B'nai Israel. In general, they lacked emuna, faith, in Hashem's plan to take them to Israel. Moshe recalls how Hashem was so angry at B'nai Israel for not trusting in him that he sentenced them to the famous 40 years of wandering in the desert. The 40 years that wiped out most of the generation of those distrusting Israelites, so they would not be allowed into the land. Moshe says that if they turn away from him again, Hashem will leave them in the desert, and then they, B'nai Ruvain and B'nai Gad, will destroy the entire people. It's interesting how Moshe phrases this. So, yes, Hashem will be leaving B'nai Israel in the desert, but he's not the one who will destroy the people. B'nai Ruvain and B'nai Gad will. Moshe puts the responsibility on those two tribes for the destruction. Authoritative parenting move number one. Fear-mongering slash scaring others is really bad just by the standard of like normal human interactions. 
fear-mongering is cowardly. You're scared or at rock bottom, so you pull down others so you're not alone. But also, unsurprisingly, this is bad in Torah terms as well. To make a person's emuna, their faith in God, or bitachon, their trust in God, shaky, is the worst part of this. And that is why what the Miraglim did was so bad. And also why Moshe is so angry that the same situation may happen again. In Parshat Shalach, where the Miraglim drama unfolds, we don't get much information regarding how Moshe feels about sending the spies in. But according to the Midrash, it wasn't his idea. It was the desire of Shivtei Yisrael, the, the tribes of Israel. This next part is my own interpretation. I found some sources with similar thinking, uh, but I am picking up on an evolution of Moshe's leadership. This last event with the Miraglim didn't end well. Moshe wasn't really prepared for such a strong move to deny God's divine path of inheriting Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. It's been about 38 years since then, so maybe Moshe reflects and thinks that he didn't voice his concerns clearly enough back then. Those concerns being something like, this isn't a good idea. What if they come back with a bad report and then the people are scared? But if I don't let them go, they'll think God and I are keeping something from them. The Torah doesn't mention if Moshe explains his reservations or not to the Miraglim back in Shalach, but his rebuke of Bnei Ruvain and Bnei Gad is very clear. This shows the evolution I am referring to. This time, instead of hoping or praying things turn out all right, he lays out his concerns about Bnei Rubin and Bnei Gad staying explicitly. He doesn't just say, no, you can't stay to the east of the Jordan River. Why can't you? Because I said so. He rather says, well, no, I don't want you to because of blank. Authoritative parenting move number two. And instead of being defensive of their desires, Bnei Ruven and Bnei Gad explain their plan seemingly sensitively. And self-security slash lack of defensiveness is a direct product of an authoritative parenting style. They explain that their desire is more selfish. It's funny that this is the time where that's better than the alternative, rather than a desire to in instigate a mutiny slash for the purpose of scaring the rest of the tribes. The text says that they draw near or approach Moshe. The word used is vayigshu, from the root negesh, that can also mean to access. This word choice is, like all Torah word choice, poignant. There are other ways to say they approached or they drew near without negesh. Negesh, though, implies intimacy. It's a move on the part of the two tribes to be real with Moshe, to remove the barriers and just talk, accessing Moshe. Look at this beautiful, open communication. Bnei Reuven and Bnei Gad explain that they plan to build places to keep their livestock and then cities for their children here in the land east of the Jordan. After that, they will hurry to fight at the front of the pack with the rest of Shivtei Yisrael and won't come back until everyone has achieved their fair share of land. Moshe says something like, Okay, if you do what you say, great. But if you don't, you will have sinned against Hashem. Know that your sin will find you. Though this isn't a direct threat, it is some strong text. It's something more powerful than a violent threat, though. It's responsibility. Moshe makes them know that their actions from here on out fall on their own heads, and they cannot escape them. Authoritative parenting move number three. Have you ever seen someone in your own life or, or in general commit bad actions but not face consequences for them? Have you gotten so frustrated that their life just seems to go on fine? I can promise you that if they've committed bad actions, they're not just fine. You may not see it for yourself, but they have made slash will lie in their own bed. My dad always says that if you think something about someone, chances are other people think that same thing too. We can't escape our actions in the same way. We can't escape our true selves. We take ourselves wherever we go. And the selves that we bring with us everywhere cannot help but be affected by the way we were parented. I know parenting is really hard. Obviously, I don't know, no, but it sure seems very hard. So I share all of this really aspirationally. God willing, I will do my best to be an authoritative parent. Check in with me in like 20 years though. <laughs> So we can copy-paste modern-day parenting techniques on Moshe because he and his Torah values are timeless. Responsibility, expectations, and communication are always relevant. I am wishing you a week full of open communication. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for listening.